Hi, my name is Forrest Gander. I have the pleasure of getting to introduce my friend Arthur Z. I want to do a little shout out to Linda Hibbs. I can't see you. Are you here? I think I know you are. She's a big fan of poetry and of Arthur's work and the mother of a terrific poet named Jonathan Skinner. This is Letter to Arthur Z from Pengrove. Arthur Z, dear friend, keeper of the Asikia del Llano, now I remember. Discovering your poems in 1985 in Tioni, that small literary magazine published by what was then called the Institute of American Indian Arts. The magazine's name, the Carison word for meeting place, was a perfectly apt venue for your work, which already in the early 80s derived its energy from the meeting of unlikely assemblages of natural description, conceptual statements, scientific observation, questions, and exclamations. Those early poems retained narrative elements that you would gradually employ less and less as you more intensively explored the bewitchments of juxtaposition. I tracked down your books, Two Ravens, and the revised edition of The Willow Wind, both from a publishing house, Tooth of Time, named for a striking igneous rock that juts straight up from the sedimentary strata of a mountain two and a half hours northeast of here. Your poems and translations in those first two books made reference to reservations, desert aspen, new Mexican native tribes, but also to Mexican history, intimate relationships, and classical Chinese poets. To wit, your roots were local, but your cultural perspectives were, from the start, international. By the time that Dazzled, your 1982 collection was published, you developed an articulate comprehension of how your poetics would need to reflect your mind's method, the way the world made sense to you. In viewing photographs of China, you wrote, quote, that instead of insisting the world have an essence, we juxtapose, as in a collage, facts, ideas, images, the Arctic turn, the Pearl Farm, considerations of the two world wars, Peruvian horses, executions, concentration camps, and find, as in a sapphire, a clear light, a clear emerging view of the world. We juxtapose, as in collage, you wrote. It was your Ars Poetica, your statement on the art itself. Since that poem, written when you were 31, until now, at age 71, the word shards has become a key to your work. As your sentencing began to incorporate more fragments, as you explored more flexible syntactical possibilities, especially parataxis, as you abandoned traditional punctuation for strikethroughs and dashes that stressed incompletion and the ongoing, as the voices in your poems became more various and multilingual, the cursing, cabron, whispering and shouting of humans, the poetically channeled voices of ponderosa pines, woo, ah, woo, 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 and lichen. And as you shifted your emphasis from discrete poems to tessellated sequences, the structures of your book, books became more, the structures of your books more rigorously enacted your maturing sense of mutuality and ravelment. No language is foreign to your poetry, not the language of childhood games, rock, paper, scissors, not the language of the Declaration of Independence, not innumerable non-English languages, not even the language of an eye exam. Your poems have continued to evolve to act out the complex intersubjectivity that characterizes the engagement between world and self. And now, Arthur, reader of the Kipu, shape-shifting poet dappled as a jaguar. I remember in your recent books how you seem to say again and again, yes, we have whole experiences, but our perceptions and memories are a juxtaposition of shards, a kind of collage. As an American book of changes, your collected poems, The Glass Constellation, referencing the Buddhist image of Indra's net, 
became a representative metaphor for your poems. Each poem or movement in a sequence is whole, like a glass teardrop, and yet prismatic and integrated with all the others in an active network of interrelation and expansive echoic meanings. It's true there isn't any single world in your poems, but a plurality of worlds. And when some imagined figure of wholeness shatters, other figures are born from the shards. So it makes sense that in your poems we find repeated images of people, a merchant, a woman, a you, trying to glue back together a smashed rocky bowl, or broken window glass, or a gray bowl, or a tea bowl. Even a dream collapses, you write, quote, into a pile of shards. And in a recently published poem in The New Yorker, you respond to one of your own questions by claiming, I who have no answers find glimmering shards. Glimmering, a word that appears at least 10 times in your newer poems, is another of your drumbeat talismanic words. The ginkgo light, the title of your remarkable 2009 collection, references the glimmer coming from August ginkgos, their wavering yellow luminescence, something not seen full on, the sheen of imbricated leaves, of shards, of multiplicity. As editors of Lost Roads Publishers, C.D. Wright and I were both so keen for your work that we wrote you in 1985 to solicit the manuscript which our press brought out in 1987. That collection includes your first long serial poem, boding the modality that would define your later work. Your title for our book, River, River, is a reduplicative, a signal feature of many Asian languages. We agreed to your striking choice for a cover, the calligraphic representation of the word song by Japanese national treasure Kaisuke Serizawa, and we sold out three editions. And so, dear Arthur, began a friendship that has lasted for 40 years, during which time we've hiked through Endesazi ruins in Chaco Canyon, picked blackberries and watched sunsets in the hills of California, visited museums, gone quiet at the feet of a giant wooden Buddha, taught side by side in a dozen states, eaten meals, taken morning walks, met with wildfire scientists, and yammered about poet poetry constantly. I've only occasionally seen you frustrated, never angry, never bitter. I can't forget the image I have of finding you asleep one early morning in our guest bed, lying on your back with your hands folded over your stomach in a transcendent peace like a reclining Buddha. You have a characteristic equanimity that has always grounded me and served as a kind of model for my own aspirations as both man and artist. When I asked another po poet how she would describe you, she said, he looks at you with clear eyes and mild wit and brilliance and vision with no rancor. Many times when we've fallen together, before you were inevitably called back to Santa Fe and your wife, the poet Carol Moldau, and your Asikia, we celebrated your major achievements. The books primarily, of course, and then the recognition those books have won. The Lannan Literary Award, American Book Award, Guggenheim Fellowship, Lila Wallace Writers Award, National Book Award, finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And your relatives celebrated you too, showing up like a pride of lions for your induction into the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And although you've been recognized in these major ways by your contemporaries, I think more about the vast influence your work has had on the landscape of American poetry, not only through your many years of guiding and supporting writers at the Institute of American Indian Arts, not only through your signal translations of Chinese poets, I think about how your long body of work anticipated and helped to shape what has now come to be called eco-poetry, and in philosophy, object-oriented ontology. For in your poems, we are constantly aware of the active presence of things in the currents of human thought and feeling. Even concepts are revealed in relation to things. Quote, now, 
When he strokes the tendons of her left wrist, she sighs. They are nowhere, everywhere, none such. They are not look back time, but full moon, first light. Your singularly inventive poems of connectivity and heterogeneity are charged with emotion, in large part through remarkable formulations of technical brilliance, hard juxtaposition and enjambed line breaks, shifting pronouns and tenses, multiple speaking voices, and a restless tacking between large scale and small scale events and images. These collaborate to create a poignant, sometimes erotic feeling of immersive encounter with others and with the world all at once. And if I sit back now and think about them, I'm awed at the way your poems emphatically correlate and interweave personal experience with place, the brutality of landscape with the sensuality of the body, the dazzle of non-human world with the ugliness and beauty of human beings, kindness and particle physics, carnality and ripening persimmons, the language of science and the language of sexual love. Your imagination draws from everywhere, from every register, description, equation, fact, found text, speech, precisely articulated feeling, and memorably vivid observations. You splay and weld this material into gorgeous formal structures that are conceptual, musical, and structural. I have to chomp on my bit to keep from getting geeky about the virtuosity of your poems. I promise to resist diagrams and dissections, but I have to admit that the knees of my mind quiver when I note the way you juggle temporal sequence and geography, or the way you align parallel verbs in different contexts, the way a late poem might circle back to its beginning, the way your canny line break creates a widowed word that serves as a copula for two independent clauses, as the word glancing, for example, attaches itself both to kestrel and you in the lines, a kestrel glides overhead, glancing below at a bare marsh. You notice also the synesthesia, moments of the past ring like tuning forks the marriages of conceptual and particular, the way as in the long poem entanglement, you shift situation, place, and lexical field while the perceptual stance remains consistent, open-ended, provocatively inquisitive. And now, Arthur Z., dear friend, I'm remembering one of your several readings at Brown University, the occasional loud exclamations leaping from your throat the staggered pulse of your phrasings, your default voice intimate, slightly smoky at the edges, an incantation broken by a shout, a gleam from the spotlight on your high forehead. Philosophically and sensorially alive, your poems have been for me, and for so many readers, a kind of codex of thought and imagination for our time, a cornucopia of rendezvous, seductive, endearing, alienating, vibrating structures, your poems come to be models for processing as feeling, as sensorial, intellectual, and linguistic experience, our brief, shimmering encounter with others and with both the inscrutability and legibility of what contains us, what we call language and the world. Arthur Z. Thank you, Forrest, for that amazing introduction. And what a pleasure and honor to be here this evening reading at the Lensic Theater. I want to start by thanking Jordan Abel, Martha Jessup, and Patrick Lannan. Thank you for all that you do. I'm going to read from my new and collected poems, The Glass Constellation. And I'm also including a couple of new poems. Anvil. When a black butterfly flits past, 
when you glimpse the outlines of apple trees, when you smell the sprig of sunrise and walk up to the ditch, when bearing Aleut, Juma, Tuscarora, join the list of vanished languages, when you turn a spigot and irrigate blossoming pear trees, when the time of your life is a time of earthquakes, when a woman hit by a car while crossing the street recovers then slides into pain, when a Matsutake emerges out of the rubble of Hiroshima, when a bartender blows smoke rings and slips through hoops into his past, when foragers slice rushulas, amanitas, clytosabes, and pursue red-capped bolites, when water slips through roots, rises through a trunk, streams into leaves, when in our bodies we sway and flood, when you bloody your hands, when the mind like this earth is struck and tilts its axis, when under summer stars you have built a cabin in the wilderness, when you gaze at Aldebaran and sense a first frost on the grass, when in our bodies we ride the waves of our earth, here is the anvil on which to hammer your days. Midnight Loon. Burglars enter an apartment and ransack drawers. Finding neither gold nor cash, they flee, leaving the laundry and bathroom lights on. They have fled themselves. I catch the dipping pitch of a motorcycle, iceberg hues in clouds. The gravel courtyards, a midnight garden, as in Japan, raked to resemble ocean waves in moonlight, whirlpool eddies, circular ripples, and nothing is quite what it appears to be. When I unlatch the screen door, a snake slides under the weathered decking. I spot the jagged hole edge with glass where a burglar reached through the window but no one marks the poplars darker with thunder and rain. In moonlight, I watch the whirlpool hues of clouds drift over our courtyard, adobe walls and gate. And though there is no loon, a loon calls out over the yard, over the water. First snow. A rabbit has stopped on the gravel driveway. Imbibing the silence, you stare at spruce needles. There's no sound of a leaf blower, no sign of a black bear. A few weeks ago, a buck scraped his rack against an aspen trunk. A carpenter scribed a plank along a curved stone wall. You only spot the rabbit's ears and tail. When it moves, you locate it against speckled gravel. But when it stops, it blends in again. The world of being is like this gravel. You think you own a car, a house, this blue zigzag shirt but you just borrow these things. Yesterday, you constructed an aqueduct of dreams and stood at Gibraltar, but you possess nothing. Snow melts into a pool of clear water, and in this stillness, starlight behind daylight wherever you gaze. Fault lines. He pours water into a cup. At room temperature, 
the cup is white, but after he microwaves it, and before steeping a tea bag with mint leaves, he notices outlines of shards have formed above the water. As the cup cools, the lines disappear. Now he glimpses fault lines inside himself and feels a Siberian tiger paced along the bars of a cell. Black, orange, white. Black, orange, white. And feels how the repeating notes send waves through him. His eyes glisten and he tries to dispel the crests. But what have I done? What can I do? Throbs in his arteries and veins. Today he will handle plutonium at the lab and won't consider beryllium casings. He situates the past in the slight aroma of mint rising in the air. Sometimes he's an astronaut suspended above Earth twisting on an umbilical cord. Sometimes he's in the crosshairs of a scope and tiger stripes flow in waves across his body. This next poem is called Lichen Song and it's in the voice of a piece of lichen up on the ceiling looking down and talking to a person. Lichen Song. And it's one run-on sentence. The poem is framed by dashes. Snow in the air. You've seen a crust on the ceiling wood and never considered how I gather moisture when you step out of the shower. You don't care that I respire as you breathe. For years, you've washed your face, gazed in the mirror, shaved, combed your hair, rushed out, while I, who may grow an inch in a thousand years, catch the tingling sunlight. You don't understand how I can dive to a temperature of liquefied gas and warm back up, absorb water, start growing again without a scar. I can float numb in space, be hit with cosmic rays, then return to Earth and warm out of my sleep to respire again without a hiccup. You come and go while I stay gripped to pine and the sugar of existence runs through you, runs through me, you sliver if you just go, go, go. If you slowed, you could discover that mosquitoes bat their wings 600 times a second and before they mate, synchronize their wings, you could feel how they flicker with desire. I am flinging your words. And if you absorb, not block my song, you could learn you are not alone in pain and grief, though you've instilled pain and grief. You can urge the dare and thrill of bliss if and when you stop to look at a rock at a fence post, but you cough, only look. Yes, look at me now because you are blink about to leave. After a new moon. Each evening you gaze in the southwest sky as a crescent extends in Argentine light. When the moon was new, your mind was desireless, but now both wax to the world. While your neighbor's field is cleared, your corner plot is strewn with desiccated sunflower stalks. You scrutinize the bare apricot limbs that have never set fruit, the wisteria that has never blossomed, and wince hearing how at New Year's teens bashed in a door and clubbed strangers. Near a pond, someone kicks a dog out of a pickup. Each second, a river edged with ice shifts course. Last summer's exposed tractor tire is nearly buried under silt. 
An owl lifts from a poplar while the moon, no, the human mind, moves from brightest bright to darkest dark. I'm going to uh, share two sequences with you this evening. And um, this first sequence is called the Ginkgo Light. And uh, one of the things I like about sequences, and certainly Forrest uh, described it so beautifully, um, in sequences, I like to be able to shift place, time, voice, rhythm from section to section. And for me, sometimes the fragments, the shards can suspend narration, and when you are no longer sure of where you're going, they uh, disorient, but they also allow the possibility of reorientation. This particular sequence is in seven, I'm going to read them as unnumbered sections, and they draw on the biology and the history of the ginkgo leaf. And um, the ginkgo leaf is um, unique in that there's a central vein or stem and then each vein splits into two, and each forking vein splits into two, and again and again and again, and that creates the fan-like shape. And um, that central stem for me is what happens when, or happened in response to the atom bomb on Hiroshima. And the, the poem will reveal that. The Ginkgo Light. A downy woodpecker drills into a utility pole while you cut stems, arrange tulips in a vase, I catch a down bow on the A string, beginning of Song of the Wind. We savor black beans with cilantro and rice, Pinot Noir. As light slants through the kitchen window, spring is candlelight at our fingertips. Ice crunches and river breakup. Someone shovels snow in a driveway, collapses, and hospitalized catches staff infection. Out of airplane wreckage, a woman identifies the ring on the charred corpse of her spouse. A travel writer whose wife is in hospice gazes at a lunar eclipse, the orange moon at one millionth of its normal brightness. A 1,300 year old lotus seed germinates. A ginkgo issues fan shaped leaves. Each hour teems. A seven year old clips magenta lilacs for her mother. Electrocuted, tagging a substation. Patter of rain on skylight. Manta rays feed along a lit underwater cove. Seducing a patient he did not anticipate plummeting into an abyss. Over Siberia, a meteor explodes. I am happiest here, now. Lesser goldfinch with nesting fiber in its beak. Love has no near or far. Near Bikini Island, the atom bomb mushroomed into a fireball that obsidianed the azure sky, splayed palm leaves iridescent black in wind. That fireball moment always lurks behind the retired pilot's eyes, even when he jokes, pours vodka, displays his goggles, metal, leather jacket hanging from a peg, a woman hums as she works with willow, exacto knife, magnifying lens to restore a hikaria Apache basket. She has no glimmer. A zigzag line is beginning to unravel. Does not know within a decade she will unload a slug into her mouth. Through a moon gate, budding lotuses in a pond. You're it. He stressed rational inquiry, then drove south into the woods, put a gun to his head, vaporized into shadows. 
Quince and peach trees leafing below the ditch. Succession and simultaneity. The branch-like shapes in their sheets. Pizzicati, up the river we will go. August 6, 1945, a temple in Hiroshima, 1130 meters from the hypocenter disintegrates while its ginkgo buds after the blast. When the temple is rebuilt, they make exit entrance steps to the left and right around it. Sometimes one fingers annihilation before breaking into bliss. A mother with Alzheimer's knows her son, but not where she lives or when he visits. During the Cultural Revolution, Shu Mo scrubbed one million dishes on a tanker and counted them in a trance. A dew point is when a musher jogs alongside her sled dogs, sparing them her weight on the ice to the finish. Loaves of bread on a rack. A car splashes a newspaper vendor on a traffic island. On the road of days, we spot zodiacal light above the horizon. Astronauts have strewn footprints and streptococcus on the moon. Chance sparks the prepared mind. A cooper's hawk perched on a cottonwood branch quickens or synapses. In the orchard, the sound of apricot blossoms unfolding. Mosquito larvae twitch water at the V-shaped berm that pools run off to the pond. We do not believe we trudge around a flaming incense burner on a road of years. As fireflies brighten, we long to shimmer the darkness with streamers. A pickup veers toward, then away, skewing light across our faces. As light skews across our faces, we are momentarily blinded and directionless, have every which way to go. Lobelia flowers in a patio pot. A neighbor hands us three bib lettuces over a fence. A cricket stridulates outside the window. And while we listen to our exhale, inhale, Ephemera become more enduring than concrete. Ginkgos flare out. A jagged crack spreads across windshield glass. We find to recoil from darkness is to feed the darkness. To suffer in time is dichotomous venation to efflorescent the time. One brisk morning, we snap the layers of overlapping fanned leaves scattered on the sidewalk. Finger, a scar on wrist, scar on abdomen. This is another voice-driven poem, and it's called Salt Song, in the voice of salt. Zunis make shrines on the way to a lake where I emerge. And Miwoks gather me out of pools along the Pacific. The cheetah thirsts for me. And when you sprinkle me on ribeye, you have no idea how I balance silence with thunder and crystal. You dream of butterfly hunting in Madagascar spelunking through caves, echoing with dripping stalactites. And you don't see how I yearn to shimmer in orange aurora against flame. Look at me in your hand. In Egypt, I scrub the bodies of kings and queens. In Pakistan, I zigzag upward through 26 miles of tunnels before drawing my first breath in sunlight. 
If you heat a kiln to 2,380 degrees and scatter me inside, I vaporize and bond with clay. In this unseen moment, a potter prays because my pattern is out of his hands. And when I touch your lips, you salivate. And when I dissolve on your tongue, your hair rises. Ozone unlocks. A single stroke of lightning sizzles to earth. This next poem is in an invented form that I call a cascade. Instead of starting each line with the same word, I gave myself the stricture of seeing what would happen if each line of a poem would pick up a word or words from the previous line. So the repetitions weave through the poem without any predictable pattern. And sometimes like the word no is picked out of the word now from the previous line. But as part of that experiment in repetition, I'm really um, after a kind of deepening of the sound, rhythm, texture, and musicality of the poem. Uh, it's great to not have to be able to explain any of the geography of northern New Mexico. Uh, so here it is, sight lines. I'm walking inside of the Rio Nambe. Salt cedar rises through silt in an irrigation ditch. The snowpack in the Sangre de Cristos has already dwindled before spring. At least no fires erupt in the conifers above Los Alamos. The plutonium waste has been hauled to an underground site. A man who built plutonium triggers breeds horses now. No one could anticipate this distance from Monticello. Jefferson despised newspapers, but no one thing takes us out of ourselves. During the Cultural Revolution, a boy saw his mother shot by a firing squad. A woman detonates when a spam text triggers bombs strapped to her body. When I come to an upright circular steel lid, I step out of the ditch. I step out of the ditch, but step deeper into myself. I arrive at a space that no longer needs autumn or spring. I find ginseng where there is no ginseng, my talisman of desire. Though you are visiting Paris, you are here at my fingertips. Though I step back into the ditch, no whitening cloud dispels this world's mystery. The ditch ran before the year of the Louisiana Purchase. I'm walking on silt, glimpsing horses in the field fielding the shapes of our bodies in white sand. Though parallel lines touch in the infinite, the infinite is here. Transfigurations. Though neither you nor I saw flowering pistachio trees, in the hanging gardens of Babylon. Though neither you nor I saw the Tigris River stained with ink. Though we never heard a pistachio shell de hiss. We have taken turns holding a panda as it munched on bamboo leaves. And I know that rustle now. I have awakened beside you and inhaled August sunlight in your hair. I've listened to the scroll and unscroll of your breath. Dolphins arc along the surface between white capped waves. Here, years after we sifted yarrow and red from the book of changes, I mark the dissolving hues in the west as the sky brightens 
above overhanging willows. The panda fidgets as it pushes a stalk farther into its mouth. We step into a clearing with budding chanterelles. And though this space shrinks and is obscured in the traffic of a day, here is the anchor I drop into the depths of teal water. I gaze deeply at the panda's black patches around its eyes. How did it evolve from carnivore to eater of bamboo? So many transfigurations I will never fathom. The arc of our lives is a brightening then dimming, brightening then dimming. A woman catches fireflies in an orchard with the swish of a net. I pick an open-mouthed pistachio from a bowl and crack it apart. A hint of a serious spills into the alluvial fan of sunlight. I read spring in autumn in the scroll of your breath, though neither you nor I saw the completion of the Great Wall. I wake to the unrepeatable contour of this breath. Black Center. Green tips of tulips are rising out of the earth. You don't flense a whale or fire at beer cans in an arroyo, but catch the budding tips of pear branches and wonder what it's like to live along a purling edge of spring. Jefferson once tried to assemble a mastodon skeleton on the White House floor, but with pieces missing, failed to sequence the bones. When the last speaker of a language dies, a hue vanishes from the spectrum of visible light. Last night, you sped past revolving and flashing red, blue, and white lights along the road, a wildfire in the dark though no one you knew was taken in the midnight ambulance, an arrow struck a bullseye and quivered in its shaft. One minute gratitude rises like water from an underground lake, another dissolution gnaws from a black center. In um, Tai Chi and Qi Gong, there's a series of warm-up moves that um, one often does, and the sort of rotating uh, movement is called cloud hands. A woman moves through a cloud hands position, holding and rotating an invisible globe. Thud, shattering glass, moan, horn blast. So many worlds to this world. Two men dip net sockeye salmon at the mouth of a river. From a rooftop, a seagull squawks and cries. A woman moves through grasp the bird's tail. Someone on a stretcher is wheeled past glass doors. A desert five spot rises in a wash. And pressing her tongue to the roof of her mouth, she focuses in the near distance on the music of sycamore leaves. Adamant. Deer browse at sunrise in an apple orchard, while honey locust leaves litter the walk. A neighbor hears gunshots in the bosque and wonders who's firing at close range. I spot bear prints near the Powaki River 
but see no sign of the reported mountain lion. As chlorophyll slips into the roots of a cottonwood and the leaves burst into yellow gold, I wonder, where's our mortal flare? You can travel to where the Tigris and Euphrates flow together and admire the inventions of people living on floating islands of reeds. You can travel along an archipelago and hike among volcanic pools steaming with water and sulfuric acid, but you can't change the eventual adamant body. Though death might not come like a curare dipped dart blown out of a tube or slam at you like surf breaking over black lava rock, it will come. It will come. And it unites us, brother, sister, boxer, spinner, in this pact while you inscribe a letter with trembling hand. This next piece is the second sequence I'm going to read this evening. And um, before I read it, I just want to make a quick aside about some uh, classic Japanese poetic forms. Uh, haiban is usually uh, a prose passage, and then there's a haiku, and then there's another prose passage, and then another haiku. And uh, of course, Basho is most famous for doing it as a kind of travelogue and journey where the inner and outer worlds combine. Instead of doing prose and then a haiku, prose and then a haiku, um, a lot of the writing process you know, is just discovering and being open to what happens and finding things you didn't know were there. So I wrote prose and then a 575 syllable haiku and then prose. And then instead of writing a second haiku, uh, I suddenly had this idea, what if I write two lines that are each seven syllables long? So the 575 and the 77 syllable short poems together create in classic Japanese poetry, tanka. In uh, Japanese, in the written language, the two characters are called kanji. And if you read Chinese, like I do, those two characters mean short song. So I love the idea that there could be songs inside of prose, or poems inside of poems inside of poems. And uh, this next piece, which um, uh, many of these I'm reading for the first time this evening, um, is here on Upper Canyon Road, Aceque del Llano. And uh, here in New Mexico, of course, we like to think of the Aceques as the lifeblood of our communities. And uh, it's a particular pleasure to be able to write about and celebrate this one. It's in four sections. Aceque del Llano, one. The word asakia is derived from the Arabic asakia, water conduit, and refers to an irrigation ditch that transports water from a river to farms and fields, as well as the association of members connected to it, blossoming peach trees to the west, steel buildings glint above the mesa. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Seque del Llano is one and a half miles long and begins at Nichols Reservoir Dam. At the bottom of the dam, an outlet structure and flow meter control water that runs through a four inch pipe at up to 150 gallons per minute. The water runs along a hillside and eventually drops into the Santa Fe River. 15 families and two organizations belong to the Stitch Association, and the Asakia irrigates about 30 acres of gardens and orchards. In the ditch, water flowing, now an eagle feather wind. Two, yarrow rabbit brush, claret cup cactus, one seed juniper, Douglas fir, and scarlet penstemon are some of the plants in this environment. 
Endangered and threatened species include the southwestern willow flycatcher, the least tern, the violet-crowned hummingbird, the American marten, and the white-tailed ptarmigan. Turning my flashlight behind me, I see a large buck three feet away. Each April, all of the members come or hire workers who come to do the annual spring cleaning. This involves walking the length of the ditch, using shovels and clippers to clear branches, silt, and other debris. Twigs, pine needles, plastic bags, clear today before moonrise. Three. The Ditch Association is organized with the Meyer Domo Ditch Manager, who oversees the distribution of water according to each Parciantes holder of water rights allotment. The Asequia runs at a higher elevation than all of the land held by the Parciantes, so the flow of water is gravity fed. Crisscrossing the ditch, avoiding Choya. I snag my hair on branches. Each year, the irrigation season runs from about April 15th to October 15th. On Thursdays and Sundays at 5.30 a.m., I get up and walk about a quarter of a mile uphill to the ditch and drop a metal gate into it. When the water level rises, water goes through screens then down two pipes and runs below to irrigate grass, lilacs, trees, and an orchard. Across the valley, 10 lights glimmer from hillside houses. Four, Orion and other constellations of stars stand out at that hour. As it moves toward summer, the constellations shift. And by, and by July 1st, when I walk uphill, I walk in early daylight. By mid-September, I again go uphill in the dark and listen for coyote and deer in between the pinyons and junipers. One by one, we light candles on leaves, let them go flickering downstream. The Ganges River is 1,569 miles long. The Rio Grande is 1,896 miles long. It periodically dries up, but it, when it runs its full length, it runs from its headwaters in the mountains of southern Colorado into the Gulf of Mexico. Water from the Santa Fe River runs into the Rio Grande. Water from the Acequia del Llano runs into the Santa Fe River. From a length of 100 paces along the Acequia, I draw or allotment of water. Here, I pull a translucent cactus spine out of your hand. Swimming laps. Swimming backstroke toward the far end of a pool in sunlight. Yellow flares in the nearby aspens. In the pre-dawn sky, Mars and Venus glimmered. How is it a glimmering moment coalesces and the rest slides like flour through a sieve. How is it these glimmerings become constellations in a pre-dawn sky? Reaching the wall, I turn and push off swimming freestyle. How is it we bobbed in water beyond the breaking surf and I taste that salt in my mouth now? How is it, disheveled, breathless, we drew each other up into flame? 
How is it that flame burns steadily within? Reaching the wall, I turn and push off, swimming side stroke. With each scissors kick, I know time's shears. This is not pre-dawn to a battle when the air dips to a windless calm. Let each day be lived, risking, feeling, loving, alive to ivy reddening along the fence. Reaching the wall, I turn and push off, swimming breaststroke. How is it I see below than above a horizon line? How is it I didn't sputter, slosh, end up staring at a Geiger counter clock mounted on a barroom wall? I, who have no answers, find glimmering shards. Reaching the wall, I pause, climb out of the pool, start a new day. And I'm going to close with the last poem in the Glass Constellation, uh, also um, so rooted here in Santa Fe, Transpirations. Leafing branches of a backyard plum, branches of water on a dissolving ice sheet, chatter of magpies when you approach, Lilacs lean over the road, weighted with purple blossoms. Then the noon sun shimmers the grasses. You ride the surge into summer. Smell of pinyon crackling in the fireplace. Blued notes of a saxophone in the air. Not by sand running through an hourglass, but by our bodies igniting. Passing in the form of vapors from a living body. This world of orange sunlight and wildfire haze. World of iron filings pulled toward magnetic south and north. Pool of quicksilver when you bend to tie your shoes. Standing, you well up with glistening eyes. Have you lived with utmost care? Have you articulated emotions like the edges of leaves? Adjusting your breath to the seasonal rhythm of grasses? Gazing into a lake on a salt flat and drinking in reflection the Milky Way. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you can take your... So um, I'm going to ask Arthur a few questions, and I thought that uh, for the audience's sake, to give you a little traction, we'd talk first about where some of his work has come from, uh, some of the springs that lead to the rivers that run through his 50 years of poetry, and then the questions will get a little more 
complicated as we go on and he'll be doing some 3D quadratic equations at the end. <laughs> so um, first, Arthur, er early in your career, you studied with a poet who was also a scholar of quantitative and computational methods for understanding literature. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to study with Josephine Miles and how that mentorship might have influenced your poetics? Um, Josephine Miles was hugely important to me. And just to back up a little bit, uh, I, I started writing at MIT. I'm a science dropout. And I studied with Denise Levertov. And she had just come east from teaching at UC Berkeley. So that's how I decided to go out to California. And it was Denise who said, you might think about uh, taking a poetry class with Josephine Miles, she's really smart and interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Berkeley classes were really huge. There were like 65 students in the poetry workshop. Oh. And like after the first class, I thought this, you know, she'll look at maybe two poems by each student for the semester. So I um, went up to Josephine at the end of the second class. And she had rheumatoid arthritis, so her Joints were all swollen, and she, it took her a long time to get into, class, into the desk and to be able to sit down and maneuver pieces of paper and, and then get up and leave. And so I had time at the end of that second class to just go up and tell her. I said, look, you know, I don't know if this is going to work out because the class is so huge. And uh, I worked with Denise in, um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and there were like 12 students in the workshop. Right. And she laughed, and she said, well, why don't you come by my house on Saturday for tea, and I'll go over your poems. Wow. And I was just kind of amazed. And then one thing led to another. And every three weeks, I was bringing a bunch of poems to Josephine's house on the weekend. And she would just go through them line by line. And she would say, think about the ending, think about this, think about, you know, it was just like amazing. I, I just wow. was like this tutorial. and. She became my advisor. The other thing was I wasn't formally an English major. And I told Josephine, I said, I want to learn classical Chinese. I want to translate ancient Chinese poetry. I have these science credits. I want to take Blake. I'm never going to graduate. <laughs> and she laughed. And she said, Arthur, just create your own major. I'm a university professor. Take whatever you want, and I'll just OK it. So that was pretty great. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So an, another sort of basic question. Um, for more than 20 years, you've taught, at, you taught at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And references to native tribes and languages and history run all through your books. Of course, you've lived a long time in Santa Fe, where multiple cul cultures often in tension, thrive, and or languish. But are there specific ways that your contact with native writers at the Institute came to influence your poems? And are there maybe some specific examples? I think during the time that I taught at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and that was 22 years, uh, a long period, 1984 to 2006, during that time, I tried not to write about the students. Uh, but I would just find myself learning astonishing things from the students. Uh, I believe James Stevens might be here in the audience tonight. I remember uh, James came into class one morning, and he said, you know, Arthur, I think one of the great mysteries to art is the disparity between intention and effect. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, wow, where did that come from? It was sort of like you as a writer can intend all you want in terms of what you think the poem is about. But it's so well known that the effect, you know, readers will see so many other different marvelous things in there that you might not even knew or aware of were there. And that sense of how much one is in control of one's language and how one gets to that scary point where you lose control and you don't know what's going to happen next, or even at the beginning when you're looking at the blank page, uh, that whole sense of creative process um, it like came out of the blue, and that was hugely important to me. Um, I remember another time, uh, Alison Hedge Koch, who's in California, 
wrote a poem entirely in Lakota, and then the last line of the poem said, I knew him well. And um, I remember looking at this, and I don't know Lakota, and I certainly wouldn't presume to, you know, I was just like, okay, tell me, describe what's going on, and did you notice the last line is in English? What's going on here? The rest is in a native language, and I remember Allison smiling and saying, oh, I was describing a farewell ceremony to a man I was close to who died, who passed away, and the ceremony ended in Lakota at the next to last line, and then without realizing it, I switched into English. I knew him well. And I thought, wow, what an amazing moment again to be, you know, when you're writing at your deepest, most intense level, trying to get language to sort of come forward, that it would be in Lakota and not English. And then to not be aware that when you've completed a ceremony, it's like that spell is done and then you can step out into another whole world or sphere into English. I thought that was sort of amazing. Yeah, so is. those are two examples. Hmm. Um, at a few watershed moments in your writing life, you've turned to translation, which you've already brought up, as a creative activity, and for models of new trajectories for your own work. Can you tell us about some of the joys and agonies, perhaps, of your translation work and how that practice did influence your own poetry? Oh, thanks for another wonderful question. I, I'm a, I translate ancient and modern Chinese poetry into English, but unlike many writers, I don't do it continuously. I tend to do it in particular sort of Punctuated in yeah. equilibrium. Yeah, <laughs> punctuated equilibrium. Uh, when I was this undergraduate student at UC Berkeley, I was really kind of shocked by how antiquated the diction in English seemed in the translations. So I consciously studied classical Chinese and wrote out the characters one by one. And I felt like studying Li Bai, Du Fu Wang Wei, the great Tang Dynasty poets, I could learn from them. So I did it on the one hand, like thinking of oh, translation would be great for readers in America, readers in English, to get a better sense of what was happening in the original. But I was also doing it selfishly as a writer because I was also thinking, what can I learn from these poems? How are they constructed? How did certain things happen and get chosen? So that period, when I was at Berkeley, it was really intensive. I was writing my own poems, but I was very consciously trying to learn from those Chinese models. And that shows in my early poetry. Mm -hmm. You can see a very clear correspondence. And then I didn't translate for a number of years. And then I wanted to try poets from different time periods. And the modernist Chinese poet, oh, Winnie nice Daw, poetry. was really important to me. Uh -huh. um, if you don't know his work, he, he was, um, assassinated in 1946 after he gave a speech in China denouncing the Guomindang government. This was um, in Sichuan province. And sometimes it's hard for us in America to realize how important poetry can be in other cultures. Winnie Dog got up and he gave the speech denouncing the corruption in the Guomindang and he was gunned down later that day. So he didn't get to live to fulfill his poetic potential, but his book of poetry called Dead Water um, is a landmark book in early 20th century Chinese poetry. And I turned to that consciously because Winnie Daw knew the classical tradition and he subverted it. He threw in all sorts of ugly images to counteract the sort of beauty of the Tang Dynasty imagery. And you get the sense of in a way, China in turmoil happening in the poetry and the poetics. Traditional Chinese poems are structured, very structured with five or seven characters to align with a, a silence that's predetermined and choreographed. When he Daw broke from the classical tradition, he wrote in vernacular Chinese, but he used nine characters to align in spoken Chinese. And he used a floating silence that moved back and forth through the lines. Instead of being. That, to me, just sort of 
was astonishing. So again, I was translating him because I thought, gee, American readers really should know this poet. And also I thought, I'm at a particular point in time where I, need, I wanted to sort of break out of that sort of idea or ideal of a well-made poem, something written in 18 or 20 lines that was like an artifact or something. So when he taught, really, really helped me sort of break out. And then recently, like you, I've been going to, you know, up until COVID, poetry festivals in China and conversations with contemporary poets in China have been influential. Um, Xi Chuan, who knows the classical tradition, who writes a lot of beautiful prose poems. I translated one of his thinking about rhythm and cadences. Mm -hmm. So again, at different periods, translating Chinese poetry has really helped me sort of think about or discover what I could do next in my own work. That, that realizing that you've accomplished something in your work, that you've got a poem that you can write and that it's really good, um, and that immediately makes you want to do something different. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. uh, Creeley <laughs> talks about that too, about he sort of came to write poems that were like little jewels and he, he got bored with that. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. how you've been mm -hmm. bored <laughs> <laughs> and what, how that has um, propelled you mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. keep evolving mm -hmm. in your work. You once told me something that you derived from the Japanese poet philosopher Dogen which was the quote, to carry yourself forward and experience myriad things is delusion. Mm -hmm. That myriad things come forth and experience themselves is awakening. Can you talk a little bit about what this assertion means to you in terms of what we might call your eco-poetics? Yeah, I'm not sure where to start. <laughs> Great question. I think, um, Dogen's uh, sentence that you quoted, for me, one of the crucial aspects is it's sort of like, instead of the Western idea of man trying, trying to impose his will on nature, it's the idea of letting go and letting things be themselves. And that's a particularly Asian perspective. And when you start to think about, for instance, the ginkgo tree and letting it be itself, it's a living fossil, it's history, it's survival, it's you know blossoming after the atom bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. I just find that staggering as a response. But um, so in a way to try and let things be themselves to sort of remove that urge to try and control things. And in the West, we make such a mess of things when we try and do that, you know, you can't really control a lot of things. But when you're trying to do that, it, it really mucks things up. And to sort of be able to step back and let go, there is an awakening, there's a realization of, oh, uh, we as you know, people, as living human beings, need to let things be themselves and to sort of have their space and to grow and develop. That's so connected to eco-poetry and poetics today in terms of the environmental movement of um, and I would connect it not just to like endangered plants and species, but uh, think about how every 14 days, I believe, a human language is vanishing off the face of the planet. The web is so interconnected, but that sense of not just awakening, but of respect and not trying to impose one's will, but to allow breathing room, breathing space. Um, so that all comes out of Dogen and that tradition. It does. The, uh, it seems like that's a kind of necessary exigency for all of us that uh, the Western world's mind has to change about mm. that relationship, about domineering nature mm -hmm. or the fires that are going on near mm -hmm. here and, mm -hmm. and in California and the disasters that we all know about. Or it will overwhelm us. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to your lichen song, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and an interesting question for me, one, one that I'm very interested in. In your prose poem, Lichen Song, that you all remember hearing just a minute ago, you channel the voice of lichen singing to us 
about time, which is one of your iterative themes, and the commonality of grief and bliss. Mm -hmm. Your poem, in fact, brings to my mind, brings me to think of the Mexican visionary healer, Maria Sabina, who cured people in her village in Mexico with the language that psychoactive mushrooms gave to her. She said the mushrooms were speaking and healing people through her. She wasn't the author of the words that came out of her, only the alembic. You aren't so often given to anthropomorphism, but in Lichen Song and a few other so uh, mm -hmm. poems, you don't veer from it. Do you think that in our time, our rigorous intellectual aversion to anthropomorphism, which is our fear of acknowledging commonalities between humans, animals, and plants, might be even more dangerous than anthropomorphism? <laughs> I'm not sure I... <laughs> um. D um, I'm wondering if, so, uh, so there's a critique about, oh, Arthur wrote a, a poem where Lycan is talking, but Lycan doesn't talk, and so that's a kind of sentimental um, uh, assertion of yourself representing what you have no right to represent. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a critique. <laughs> okay. Descartes had this critique, and he dissected his wife's pet dog um, vivisected it in front of an audience of, of people to sh prove that its, its writhing and, and yelping um, were just, uh, w w were not like human mm -hmm. writhing and yelping, mm -hmm. but were mm -hmm. just automatic. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he proved that. <laughs> but um, I'm interested that you take the chance, the risk, mm -hmm. to anthropomorphize mm -hmm. when our culture tells us not to do so. And it seems like our culture tells us a lot of things about that, that constitute that attitude we have about controlling nature. Yeah, I, I, obviously it is risky. But, you know, one of the things I think I want to continue to do as a poet is challenge myself. Mm. And you mentioned that sort of restlessness. And um, so formally sometimes, you know, like in a sequence, I'll have fragments that break up narration so a reader is like, what's going on here? But the idea is to really get the reader to stop and look around and re-envision. And oftentimes I think there's a tendency like to say, if you're reading a poem, a contemporary poem, and there's an I, unless it's clearly, you know, her per persona that's say given away in the title, one tends to think of a speaker as, you know, said in, modern society, basically, or culture. And I wanted to play with the idea of subverting or making uneasy the idea of who's speaking, who has the authority to speak, what is really going on here. And um, it took me a long time. It wasn't like something I just thought, oh, I'll do it. But it was, in many ways, a kind of repetition where Carol and I lived in Hakona. And um, I would get out of the shower and there'd be a piece of like <laughs> about the Viga. And it was just like, God, that thing hasn't changed in like years, you know. And then I thought, well, think about what a lichen might have experienced its whole history, its whole. And I thought, well, why not? Let's just uh, go for it and see what it might say to a person. <laughs> why not? That's, that's the beginning of all good uh, art, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, would you say that in a general way your earlier poetry strength was defined by precision with images and juxtaposition, but your later poetry became more complex where image, for instance, in the, for instance in the serial poem Kipu, is not more important than the multiple grammatical functions of the word as, which appears as an, adver as an adverb, conjunction, preposition, and a noun? Um, yeah, I think the, I mean, I'm, I'm always, I love strong images. And that, again, probably comes out of ancient Chinese poetry, nature poetry. But for me, there's such an immediacy and power to that visual image that, uh, so I don't necessarily want to give it up, but my relationship to the image has probably changed over time. 
And in that particular book that you're referring to, Kipu, um, which, if you don't know, it's a recording device that the Incas used. So it's spun, primar usually cotton, and then there are knots, and the knots hang, these strings hang off of the main string, and they think um, the Inca language may be encoded in these knots. Well, as I thought about it for a metaphor for a language, I wanted to push myself, and looking at the structure of my sentences, I thought, well, maybe the sentences could be longer. Maybe they could be syntactically more complex. Maybe I could take certain phrases that would extend or stretch meaning or meanings. So in this title poem, Kipu, I like secrets to poems in a way, secrets that can help a writer write the poem but aren't necessarily crucial for a reader to understand it in this particular sequence. I used the word as again and again and again, but each time with a different dictionary definition meaning. So even though it's being repeated, it was being repeated with a variation, which I actually see as like oral poetry in a way, you know, all the way back to Homer of elegant variation. But uh -huh. I, in that case, wanted to take words that were maybe even anti-image, like the word as, or there's one poem called X, X and O, and the poem is 30 lines long, it's linguistically one sentence, and it's like X out this, X out that, X out this, and that repeating pattern is syntactically like trying to stretch out different layers. So again, I was consciously taking a word and maybe thinking of the mathematical idea, or you know, that it's an unknown, um, and using it in a way that I had never done before, so that it's really trying to expand my sense of what I could make happen in a poem, but not necessarily sacrifice that love of the power of poetic images. Uh -huh. Those of you who, who, who will want to get his book, uh, his uh, collected poems tonight, should look at uh, a poem um, in there called Six Persimmons, which we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's an example of the way Arthur has secrets in poems. And although none of the poems, although in some ways it's an ekphrastic poem, we're not really looking at the six persimmons in the six poems. But there are subtle ways that, we, that there's a ripening going on from poem to poem. And it's kind of a secret reading of that poem that I like. Um, I have a poem, I have a question uh, about the X and O from Kipu, but I thought I would ask you a different question first because we're running out of time. Um, Arthur, you draw language and inspiration from every conceivable source, from science papers, from eye exams, from National Geographic, native basketry and weaving, mathematics, and you also reference Native American, Mexican, Mayan, Incan, Chinese, Japanese, and the Waddell cultures, among others, with a kind of democratic determination that everything is entangled and valuable to note. You've never, to my knowledge, been accused of cultural appropriation, in part, I think, because of the way you handle such references with restraint. Like, for example, the Mayans keyed their lives to the motion of Venus in a poem called Early Autumn. How do you go about juggling so many allusions to ancient and contemporary cultures quite different from your own. I, th I think um, for me it's not so much the issue of restraint as respect mm -hmm. to begin with. So in working with another culture, one isn't appropriating and using it for its own means. I'm going to go beyond time here a little bit. Um, when I taught at the Institute of American Indian Arts, as the director of the creative writing program, I felt a particular responsibility for the native students. So when Anglo anthropologists would call and say, Arthur, can we sit in on a class and interview students? Or can I write you know, a paper about what's happening? I said, no. And when a um, poet actually wrote me and said, I'll teach for free for an entire year at the Institute, 
just let me come and I'll teach you whatever you want. You won't have to pay me. I thought, mm, just doesn't feel right. I, I said no. And then two years later, I heard this poet was editing an anthology of Native American poetry for a European publisher and wanted to be able to put his name and put visiting Professor Institute of American Indian Arts under his name. Yeah, obvious, that's such obvious cultural appropriation and offensive. On the other hand, in working with Native students, for instance, after 22 years when I left the Institute, I had this idea of thinking of the privilege it was to work with so many students from so many different tribes. I sort of wrote out the names of like 30 students who to me were unforgettable over the years. And then I thought that's too literal. And then I thought at the Institute at graduation, it's customary to name the student's name and then their tribe. And I thought, that's it. I'll substitute the tribe for each individual student. And then the 30 tribes became like a roll call. And for me, it was a form of honoring. So I didn't feel like I was appropriating. I was hopefully trying to like honor and say, this is something I learned and I'm giving back and I'm writing to memorialize. So that sense of using another culture, it's not like I sit down and say, okay, now I'm gonna, it comes out of personal experience. Mm -hmm. When I drew on the Mayan phrase, I met Dennis Tedlock, who is a renowned translator of Mayan. He translated the Popol Vuh into English. And I'll never forget Dennis, like one day after a hike, opening up this thing, and I'm like, what is that? And he's saying, well, this is the Mayan calendar. Let me show you the road of days. So it was like, again, this sort of very personal connection and like a, a whole world was being revealed to me. And I think a lot of it ultimately is about excitement and wonder at the world and feeling like if we treat each other with respect, uh, it can be okay to use phrases or words or ideas from other cultures. In a way, it's the ancient Chinese Silk Road that we're constantly, things are in motion and we're constantly learning, it's an exchange. It's not one over the other. Yeah. There's, the Chinese poet Lao Tzu says, those who are not in constant awe, surely some great tragedy will befall them. <laughs> Arthur Z is our poet of constant awe, and he's one of our greatest poets. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.